So, um, about Frontier. Uh, we've heard from a couple thousand of you uh, about our back and forth with the airline, which is now getting some nationwide discussion. If you missed it, I called out Frontier Management for using hardworking flight attendants as awkward props during executives' long speeches about the virtues of being an ultra-low-cost airline. Frontier's head of corporate communications then wrote back that I'm a jerk with short man's disease and various other insults. Well, in the last 24 hours, this has gone from funny to kind of concerning. Because anyone should be able to criticize a corporation, a hometown business, without fearing improper retaliation. Judging by Frontier's customer satisfaction rate, second worst among airlines, plenty of you have some critical things to say about Frontier, and you should be able to say them publicly without Frontier doing what it now admits it did in this case, improperly accessing my travel history and future reservations after our report. Jim Faulkner, the head of corporate communications who explained that I'm a jerk with height issues, he was scheduled to leave the company already on Friday. Frontier says he's out today. His boss, Frontier's vice president of communications, Tyree Squires, she apologized for ordering the improper accessing of my travel history and reservations after I criticized her company. I asked Frontier a direct question today. Is it standard practice to look for potentially compromising information, say, a history of complaints? when they're publicly criticized by a passenger or a journalist. Frontier wrote back, quote, we take the privacy of our customers seriously and have strict standards in place for accessing travel plans or other related customer information. It won't happen again. For the record, when Frontier went searching my file to see if I'm some disgruntled passenger with an ax to grind, what they found is I have been a regular Frontier customer for a decade without any complaints, even when they went to their ultra low cost model. And I was due to fly Frontier again in a week. Needless to say, I book different flights and they can keep my money. And they should keep in mind when you or I raise a concern, responding with personal insults or rifling through our personal records, that's not low cost, that's low class. Tragedy on the water today for a family in Highlands Ranch while they were in New Hampshire. 12 year old Zoe Anderson, who was learning to water ski, was hit and killed by a boat with her father at the controls. Investigators say L Sherwood Anderson tried to circle around and was distracted just for a moment as his hat blew off his head. It was long enough for him to see uh, not see his daughter. His wife and the victim's 14 year old sister were also on the boat at the time they were visiting family in New Hampshire. The Jefferson County Grand Jury issued 29 indictments of theft, fraud, forgery, and embezzlement against this man. So there's 66 right there. Whom we followed in 2015 enforcing the law. Anthony Joyner went from clean-shaven lieutenant of the Morrison Police Department to a man with a much different look, now accused of taking $132,000 from the town of Morrison and residents like Barb Jones. Unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable, because I know all the wonderful people in this town and I can't believe that he would, you know, uh, lower himself to that. Investigators say Joyner started a nonprofit called 5280 Police Motors Memorial Fund and funneled donation checks, revenue from the sales of police cars, wages from other off-duty officers working at Bandemir Speedway, wages for himself working at Bandemir while still on the clock for the police department. Investigators even say Joyner pretended to attend CSU to receive financial educational assistance. When we talked to retired Metro State Criminal Justice Professor Joe Sandoval. Well, my initial reaction was, oh no, here we go again. He says these allegations come at a bad time, socially. When police are distrusted so much and where they are being subjected to assaults, that this kind of, uh, of, of crime now comes forward. Morrison's town administrators say $132,000 is a lot of money for Morrison, and the town has filed for insurance claims to cover the costs with hopes of getting the money back from Joyner. That temptation, that temptation is, is really inexcusable. And somebody who has greedy thoughts in mind and they take what doesn't belong to them, it's just totally wrong. It's something the town is currently trying to fix. In Morrison, Nelson Garcia, 9 News. The memories emerge 
like snapshots. Polaroids. For so many, that night exists in noise and still frame. It was just carnage. It was just people shot. Mental manifestations of the otherwise inexplicable. There isn't a day goes by that I don't think about that theater. And there are so many people that still don't talk about it, that still don't release it. It's their private demon and it haunts them. Theirs are lives forever changed by memories, some of which have faded, some of which remain raw. And there's plenty that were there that are not sitting here right now. Eight of the 100 plus officers who responded to one of the worst mass shootings in American history. Who's a different person today than they were five years ago in a big way? Is that because of July 20th? Yes. Yes. Uh, is there anybody here who doesn't think about it every day? I think In one way day. or another? Yeah. yeah. It's still there. Still there, even now. Anybody still avoid going by that theater? Yes. Man, it's like a man. John Gonzalez, first officer in. I could still hear the gunfire when I got it to the door. John Merrick, second in. People everywhere, there were still people inside, people down. We didn't know how many people were tied to this. Brian Butler, now retired. As I'm running towards the door and people are running out, they're like, all right, here in the next 30, 45 seconds is when I get shot, so here we go. As more than a thousand moviegoers poured out, they ran in. There's no one else gonna come. You're it. There's no one to call. There's no one gonna show up. There's no one gonna take your place. If you don't do it, no one else will. The volume of this night was just beyond your senses. Jerry Johnsgard, the sergeant. You become a cop for a reason, this is the reason. I was just one of the people that was on one side of the building. Jason Oviat, arresting officer. When I first saw him, I thought he was a cop. Few people are as averse to the H word as they. Who's a hero here? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, everybody who was there. People call you guys heroes all the time. That's super, it's a loose term. I mean, yeah, a hero is also a sandwich, so. <laughs> Asked in this, however. I'm proud of you guys, of all the guys that are around you right now. Immensely. Hmm? And the aversion dissipates. So the only time I, I actually find myself getting choked up is when I talk about how proud I am of, uh, of everybody's response. Stephen Redfern, the officer who made a critical decision. We've got to do something, these people are dying here and, and we're not getting the help we need. In less than 30 minutes, 27 of the most seriously wounded left not in ambulances, but in police cars. An evacuation of patients unlike anything anyone in this country had ever seen. So that's what, that's what we did and it seemed to work. Cars are pulling up, we're picking people up, we're putting them in cars, the next car will pull up. That, that saved lives. You guys saved some lives that night. We like to think so. The doctors told us afterwards that everybody who had survivable injuries survived, so. And that was everybody that responded. Proud of them? Absolutely. James Waselko, war veteran. You don't expect to see those type of things in the United States. He carried out wounded. How you guys are all doing? It depends. On? The day. Yeah. And it's just kind of that, you know, every once in a while, you still doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing okay. Just kind of go from there. Yet, all right and okay aren't adjectives all of the officers might use. You had one of the worst tasks that night. I did. Mike Hawkins, father of six. I can see it on your face. This is hard to talk about. Yeah. Carrying Veronica Moser Sullivan out of the theater was his assignment that night. I could not find her pulse. And Sergeant John's guard just said, stop it, get her out of here. And I ran out with her. And when I got into the parking lot, I realized that she had expired. And five years later, he can still feel every word he said to Veronica's parents. And it was important to me that they knew that um, that she was taken out by daddy and that uh, I have a daughter that age and I'm 
very cognizant of uh, what was lost. What was lost for them and for him? There was a period of time where it became kind of like a PTSD experience to carry my daughter upstairs to bed. Just one of a multitude of memories that exist. We weren't going to leave anybody behind. In still frame. That's what we get paid to do, make an end. Polaroid. People lived. Memories of a night that will forever live in the minds of those who responded so quickly. You cannot move on from that, no, no. It will always be a part of you, for better, for worse. And I'm trying to look at the for better aspect of it.